This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Cork Street Galleries. To find out more about the original home of the art world, go to corkstreetgalleries.com. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to A Brush With, the podcast where I talk to artists about their cultural experiences and influences, the artists that have inspired them, the writers and poets they read, the musicians they listen to and the cultural encounters that have proved to be epiphanies. And for this final episode of the third series, it's A Brush With, Doho Sa. He's an artist with a profound capacity to create wonder. Doho was born in Seoul in Korea in 1962 and did a degree and master's in art in Seoul in the 1980s before repeating that study cycle with a BFA and an MFA in the US in the 1990s. I first saw Doho's work at Tate Modern and the work was called Staircase 3 and it's unforgettable. The room is bathed in red as the light is filtered through a polyester ceiling in that colour and from that ceiling a staircase in that same red fabric hangs in mid-air. And that form is a one-to-one rendering of the staircase that led from Doho's New York apartment, which was at 348 West 22nd Street, to his landlord's apartment above. It's a humdrum architectural feature in an unspectacular building, but it's made transportive and spellbinding by its material and the way that Doho has displayed it in the gallery. Staircase 3 is one of a huge range of works in which the spaces that Doho has lived in throughout his life have been reconstructed in these alluring coloured fabrics, from his family's Hanok-style home in Seoul, to his first home in the US when he studied at the Rhode Island School of Design, to the New York apartment, to his home and studio in Berlin where he spent a year on residency, and in his current home in London. He painstakingly stitches not just the form of the rooms, but the in-between spaces like that staircase and the elevators and corridors, and then details within them like appliances and sinks and boilers, light switches, pipes and doorknobs. And together these works form an extraordinary sculptural project about home, about architectural space and how our bodies interact with it, about migration and displacement, and about memory, personal and collective. And those in-between spaces that I mentioned are metaphors in Doho's work for a sense of passage and for identity. What's magical about Doho's fabric pieces is that they form solid sculptural objects and yet they dissolve with light. They're physical yet spectral. They evoke our memory of place and how it becomes blurred and exaggerated. And Doho's inventive use of gallery spaces to display the works, whether that's mirroring them or hanging them above us, only adds to that sense of the shifting nature of memory and how perspectives are impermanent and subjective flux. Now Doho's also made a range of less well-known work about public and shared experience about the individual and the collective. For instance, an early work, Public Figures, was a plinth with no single statue on it but hundreds of tiny figures beneath it holding it up and then similarly his work Floor featured hundreds of those same tiny figures beneath a glass surface which visitors tentatively walked on. He's also made work using clothing right from the start like High School Uniform from 1997 which features 300 Korean boys uniforms sewn together in a grid and it was the connection between clothing and the fabric representations of his homes that I wanted to begin our conversation by exploring. So I started by asking Doho whether he sees architectural space almost like a living body. I see clothing as the most smallest, most intimate space that one person can carry. So when you expand that idea, it becomes non-architecture. And so I guess that the idea of the clothing, because it's something that envelops uh, your flesh and bone, but also it imposes a, a certain identity. So it's really sort of conditions you in a way, and both culturally or politically. And uh, I think that is very similar to what uh, architectural space does. And uh, it's a cultural product, both of them. And you're basically born in there. And so from the day one, you're basically shaped by, by these surroundings. So for me, it was quite natural to connect the notion of a clothing and the architecture at the same time. And uh, the culture I grew up, um, I think the architecture is a little bit different than here. I would say it's more porous and it's more ambiguous. It's not like 
solid brick wall that separates inside and outside. We have a f- many gray areas um, that is in between, you know, outdoor and indoor. And, uh, and then there's a lot of elements that, you know, sort of evokes the idea of the clothing. Like, for example, you know, the control of the light with the uh, paper before we started to use the glass. And uh, so those things were all, you know, for me, nicely to fit to the, the, the concept of the clothing, I guess. I've noticed also that when you were talking about, for instance, measuring space and in the work where you put paper all around your New York apartment, Mm. um, you talked about as you're doing it, that it was a loving gesture, that you were Mm. caressing the space. Mm. Again, that's it's an indication of that intimacy, that bodily intimacy. Yeah. So I guess that if you live in a one place long enough, I mean, this is just my experience, but I, you know, I lived in one apartment for more than 20 years in New York. And uh, I kind of noticed that, you know, at the very beginning, that there's a space between my body and the wall. But as you live longer in that space, and it, it's just that gap is, is, is kind of getting closer and closer. And then sometimes you don't feel like the separation between and the room and your body. And, and then it feels like the wall becomes my skin. And then finally, the whole space comes into your body and become your, almost like your internal organ. And so I experienced that sort of sensation. It's very bodily experience, I think, interacting with the, with the space to me. And also over long period of time, your energy um, has been accumulated in that space, especially the lot of everyday objects, for example, light switches or sockets, and you touch them every day all the time without thinking about it. And if you lived in the one place for over 20 years, you know how many times that you have touched that you know, light switch when you enter your room. But uh, in order to make my fabric architecture piece or, you know, rubbing pieces. I think the process of making those pieces, especially at the beginning, is very similar and, and I, because I needed to measure them. And there's no other way to do it. You know, I have to do everything by hand with a tape measure. Even, you know, 3D scanning technology uh, cannot actually depict the precise measurement. So it's a very tactile and very labor intensive process. So basically you have to measure every, you know, nook and cranny of, of this room. And, and then it's basically caressing the entire space. There's no shortcut for it. Also by doing it, it brings so many memories that you have built in that space while you're living in there. And so it's a loving and very caring gesture, but at the same time, it's a kind of the process of mourning in a way, because particularly the rubbing piece that I did in my New York apartment, I have to move out from that flat because my landlord passed away and the children decided to sell the house. So uh, I wanted to do something in that space before I leave. So I found the measuring is very, very emotional process. The measuring and then the rubbing of in that space, and just and, and generally with, like with your work with thread, the way that these objects are you sewing, it seems to me that even though you embrace sculpture when you came to the US, particularly, your work still has its roots in drawing, in the sense that you know these are these are works that have that tactility, they have that hand element you know absolutely at their core so the, it's always seen that you you coming to the US is a sort of rupture in your career but do you do you actually see it more as a sort of continuation and just a change in your language perhaps but still in keeping with how you were thinking when you were in Seoul to be honest i think that the question of or notion of the transportability of the space has started before i left korea and interesting thing is, actually, I complained I, I complain this to uh, one of the curators in, in Korea. And because nobody 
both Korean or you know non-Korean curators or um, critics or art historians ask me about the work that I did before I left Korea. Because they you know, <laughs> just my career and life exist the moment I actually moved to U.S. But that's not true. I have to say, though, you know, moving to U.S. was one of the most important and difficult experience in my life. That's the fact. But uh, the seed was already planted when I was living in Korea. You know, so, for example, one of the works that I did in Korea was I had a studio that was outside of Seoul and was abandoned factory. And it was probably maybe 300,000 square feet. And it was huge factory space. And I was allowed to use the small part of it, which was the office space, but it was not completely closed. So there was a partition, but then the entire space of that factory was connected to my studio. And uh, one of the things that I did was I blew the, the, the hundreds of balloons and then tossed those balloons over that partition, the wall. And it was a kind of performative gesture to transport the breath of the artist into the, the different space. And then um, I was invited to a group show. So what I did was I collected all these balloons into big, clear uh, plastic bag. It's like probably like 50 meter long plastic tube and, and then brought it to the gallery space. So I started to think about the ways to transport the space from one place to the other already. And that was shortly disrupted because of my military service, military uh, duty. And then soon after that, I went to to U.S. But actually, it was an education in U.S. to help me to actually uh, develop those ideas further. And then I started to think about uh, the notion of home, which didn't exist before I was living in Korea. When you're living in home, you don't think about home, but you start to think about it. It really exists once you left home. So that sort of a, my thoughts on home combined with the idea of the transportability of the space. So that's how it all started. And so it is really important to actually look back what I did in Korea, in my mind. Before we get on to the, to the questions that we ask school, I guess, I wanted to ask you a bit about displaying your work and your use of the entire gallery space because the thing that I find so often disarming about your work is that you have these intimate spaces that are then made monumental to a certain degree but you're often displaying them in very bombastic spaces you've shown in buildings de designed by Zaha Hadid by Rem Koolhaas for instance and, mm. and and I wonder it seems to me that you think very hard about how to interpret those spaces and and with which works can you say something about engaging with those kind of spaces when your practice is a kind of architectural language I, I think in a way I consume those architectural space. Actually, I never designed any building or anything like that. I, but I, I think I respond in a certain way to this architectural spaces. And uh, yeah, you mentioned Zaha Hadid building in Cleveland and Ram House building in Seoul. You know, with all the respect, I really admire their work. But often these buildings as a museum are very difficult to, to work with. Uh, and uh, the buildings are actually a work of art as itself. And, uh, but I found a lot of artists are having a hard time to walk around that space. But uh, for me, luckily enough, I was able to uh, find the corners or spaces in that buildings that those spaces were not considered as a part of the exhibition space. So often you understand how brilliant these architects are when you're actually looking at that sort of non-spaces. We have a tendency to see like gallery spaces or lobbies, but I think the real beauty is actually this 
uh, transient spaces. And uh, so, to be honest, for both buildings I work with, I had a, such a great pleasure and fun, especially the Zaha Hadid building. I found this uh, very narrow and tall space between the, uh, the ramp and, and the gallery space. And obviously nobody used that space before. And for some reason that caught my eye. Uh, and, uh, and then I spent like months just looking at that space on the computer, just rotating in a many different angles. And then I didn't come up with a new piece for that space. Actually, I found old piece that could perfectly fit in the space. And so on the computer model, the distance between my piece and that, that space was probably two inch apart, but the computer model and the real building doesn't match all the time, <laughs> right? So uh, unless you're dealing with a building in Japan, which is absolutely precise. But oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's from my experience. When you measure the space, the Japanese buildings, they're like, tolerance are just incredible. Right. And, uh, but, you know, the rest of the world, it's a little bit different. <laughs> and so I have the museum people to measure. I, I don't know how they measure it, but the last thing that you want is you bring this huge installation piece and then realize that it would not fit. So that, that actually turned out to be pretty accurate to the model. So I just fit that piece, which was the, the, the staircase in my New York apartment in fabric, and it just fit in perfectly. And then I think the way it did was to help the occupants of the, the museum or visitors to be able to see that the museum space or Zaha Hadid works in a different light. So it often transforms the experience in that space in a, in a different way. And then whenever that happens, it just makes me so happy. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? There are probably two different artists. And one is before I became an art student. So it was an anonymous painter, probably 17th to 18th century in Korea. And if I wanted to, I could have uh, probably trace him back and guess what his or her real identity was. But uh, because there was a handful of very well-known painters for that very specific genre, and often uh, those painters were well-known professional painters uh, or core painters, but somehow they remained anonymous. So they did this, the painting that I am about to explain, and it was my parents' place, and there was, and always has been, this 10-panel folding screen of underwater seen with all kinds of fish and animals, uh, crabs, prawns, both freshwater and, uh, and the seawater fish. And it is painted mostly in black ink uh, with the, the light touch of watercolor here and there, but it's mainly a monochromatic painting. And uh, it's a very unusual for this type of painting when others are very decorative and colorful. So I grew up with that and, you know, each panel depicts, uh, you know, certain types of fish, you know, in groups and heading to the certain directions. And you can tell they are not uh, from pure imagination because you could uh, recognize those fish. So uh, it was from the observation, but it was not the same way the scientific illustration was done in sort of Western tradition. So it was a, also very painterly. You can see the brush strokes and uh, you can see this kind of shallow depth of uh, field, which you can find from the Eastern paintings. You know, we call it orakto, which means a joyful fish painting. And, uh, Basically, it is 
uh, an allegorical painting. It, each fish has a symbolism. And uh, people in Korea used to have those paintings in their um, house because they believe that having this kind of uh, painting uh, would bring them prosperity, you know, longevity, fertility, all that stuff and success of life. I like the fact that these are done by anonymous painters and it was intentionally, I think, anonymous. Actually, this could be also uh, fall into the category of minhua, which means folk painting. Minhua, it consists of two words and min is actually people, so ordinary people. And hua means a painting. And in Korea, we often refer ourselves as a mincho, which means grass people. And so these paintings is not the high art, but that doesn't mean that these are done by the professional painters. It's, it's a little bit ambiguous in that sense, and uh, it's not completely belongs to the pop culture, but it actually communicates with, uh, with the ordinary people. And that's a kind of fact that I really liked about this type of paintings. And, uh, but for me, uh, as a child, it was a portal for me to enter this imaginary underwater world that I could wander around with those fishes and I could spend hours by just looking at this uh, folding screen as since, since I was born. And I think I want to believe actually one of the reasons that I wanted to become a marine biologist was probably this folding screen by the anonymous painter. My passion was being a marine biologist. I wanted to study fish and I was really, really focused. And I mean, I studied really, really hard. And But then my math was not good enough to enter a university in biology uh, major, I, I just hated it. I found out that I would be able to go to the science program. And then just out of blue, I just switched to the art. And that's a still mystery why I kind of dropped passion of my life up to that point and then decided to become an artist. I, I still don't know. Anyway, so I went to art school. And, uh, and then I majored Eastern painting or Korean painting. And I became obsessed with uh, this artist, a uh, Chinese artist. Uh, his name is Bada Shenran. And uh, he is a, such a mysterious figure. He's categorized as a refugee painter. Uh, because he was born in a very uh, prestigious family, like a noble, like aristocrat family in a Ming dynasty. And when Ming collapsed and uh, Qing dynasty took over, he refused to be part of the Qing dynasty. So he, he became a Buddhist monk and wandering around the world. And then he, he, he painted uh, and then he became insane. And uh, it's a very mysterious figure, but I absolutely fell in love with his painting. And my father, who is an artist, also introduced his painting when I was little. His subject matter is a lonely bird, often or nameless flowers. And it was done in such a economy of lines and dots. And it's very simple and uh, it's all black and white, but I never encountered any painting that released a sense of dejection and then loneliness. And also I could send his madness and it's really sipping up from his painting. <laughs> and then uh, two years ago, when I visited Korea, uh, there was a huge exhibition of another, uh, my favorite Chinese master, uh, Chi Ba Shi and his colleagues and influence. It was a massive uh, exhibition. And unexpectedly, there was a huge body of Badashan Ran's painting. Instantly, I had a goosebump all over my body. And I just, what is that expression? Like a butterfly in your chest? The butterflies you know, in your the, stomach. Yeah, that kind of, yeah, yeah. Or stomach. Yeah, it's like 
I haven't seen his original painting for a long time. And then it, it did the same thing again. And uh, so it's just such a powerful paintings. How oh, wonderful. And of course, you made that piece called Gate, in which you very deliberately made an animation that referred to historic Eastern painting. And, you know, and I guess, therefore, there was part of your own history connected to that, right, in that work. It was, it was about your own experience of making ink drawings. Yes, I think that piece was commissioned by the Seattle Art Museum for the occasion of their collection exhibition of Asian treasures. And it was a really interesting and productive dialogue that I had developed throughout that, the preparation of the exhibition with the curator. And often Asian artists who lives in the Western world, I feel my role is also a bridge between two cultures. And a lot of American institutions approaches me to collaborate with them. I, I guess they, they think I understand both worlds. So... Because of my background as a as an Eastern painter, I could relate to so many artworks in that exhibition at the Seattle Art Museum, and I just wanted to provide a little bit of context of the Eastern painting to the Western audience. And uh, so I think sometimes moving images is actually quite uh, powerful. Yeah, so it was my understanding of the Eastern painting by using uh, images from their collection. Let's talk about contemporary artists now. Um, which contemporary artists do you most admire? Oh, yeah, that's a tough one as well. Uh, I have so many great artists I admire. So if you don't mind, I'll just list a bunch of artists. <laughs> First one is the uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres. And I love his sensibility, the sense of sorrow. And it's a bit like Bada Shanran, this bittersweetness of his work. But conceptually, what I'm really interested in his practice is particularly those offering pieces like a stacks of candy. He actually questions, in my mind, the notion of author. And authorship. Yeah. I mean, there's no signature, and he didn't make that piece. And uh, it was a written agreement between Felix and the museum. Yeah. So it's a piece of paper, basically, and a couple of sentences that describes the work and how to prepare the candies, for example. So he specified the wrapping paper of the candy and then where to get the the candy. And then that's a, such a radical idea to make art. I could totally relate to that. And then offering something, people can take these things and, and then next morning, there's all another pile of candy. So the materiality of the work may be so ephemeral, but this is the ultimate eternal piece. I'm really drawn into his way of thinking. The next artist is Anne Hamilton, American installation artist. She was my hero and still is. I love her sort of scale of her work and also creating something about unspeakable. Uh, and her work is not verbal. She has a great ability to combine physical sight and the intangible context of sight. And the next one is Matthew Barney. His energy or energy from his work is a little bit like Binhua painters, you know, the folk art painters. And his work releases this unearthly energy. He's a very smart and intelligent person. Have you seen him talking about his work? Yeah. I mean, it's so, his, his dense references, that extraordinary mind, it's kind of like, it, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to grasp the, exactly. just the sheer volume of that kind of thinking, right? Right. He actually comes up with his own terms to describe his practice and it makes total sense. I mean, it sounds absurd, but really his work is not about the intelligence. It's about his memory that built in in his body. I mean, he openly talks about his experience as an athlete, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the sort of memories that that has been handed over to him from the ancestors. 
you know, it's, there's just something very raw about it. And he's one of very rare artists who could actually channel that karmic energy to his work. And it's just incredible. And then Richard Serra. And on the surface, you know, I like his work because he, his work has been helping me to think about the notion of the sight and sight specificity. But deep down, Sarah is a very similar artist like Matthew Barney in terms of their, his energy level. I mean, no wonder why Matthew actually invited Mr. Sarah to perform yeah. one of my favorite pieces of his early work, Splash, throwing molten lead onto the corner of the Rotunda Gallery at the Guggenheim. And the short films that he did in early 60s. And also Matthew did a lot of interesting short films and they share very similar energy. Obviously, Bruce Nauman and Namjoon Park. I mean, they did everything that we're doing now, 20 or 30 years ago. So basically, Bruce Nauman, when I saw his first retrospective at MoMA, probably around 1992 or three, I just felt he drew a, a roadmap for all the new generation of artists. He did everything in his 20s. Yeah. And then you can find so many references in the work of much younger generations up to now. And Namjoon Pak, same. Kara Walker and Ellen Gallagher. I love the way they tackle uneasy issues of the race and trauma of the colonialism in a very powerful and elegant way. And also I happen to know them very early when we we're all students. And uh, it's just incredible to see how their practice has been evolved. Another female artist, Janice Carbell. She's a Canadian artist, lives in London. I love her very particular conceptual rigor in her work. But at the same time, it provides such an interesting formal uh, pleasure as well. And uh, Rachel Wright Reed. I could have easily gone to the direction what she has been exploring. If I went to US maybe six months earlier, I could totally relate it to her work. I was actually planning to cast a small abandoned studio at the school I went. So that was maybe two years after I moved to US and went to the art school. I was having my dinner at the school cafeteria and, you know, this boring dormitory meal and just chewing that thing. And, and then a friend of mine, who's an architect major, just dropped this black and white picture on the table. And then he said, hey, bro, you got to check this out. <laughs> and because he's the one I had an ongoing dialogue and we we're going to cast this room because he was going to help me. And we talked about the casting room and inversions of the, the negative space to the positive or vice versa. And it was a picture of a small room that Rachel Whitehead casted. And she did it about six months before. So you can imagine what the word that came out of my mouth, <laughs> you know? So it's a four letter word. And, uh, and it completely ruined my dinner. But so I didn't cast the room. And then I'm glad that I didn't actually cast that room. It actually allowed me to explore the notion of space or personal space in a more loose way. And I could have easily gone to Rachel's direction. I mean, this is a very crude way to, to say it, but her work really represents sort of the Western thought process. And mine represent more Eastern thought process. Uh, basically dealing with the space. Anthony Caro and Carl Andre. I mean, Anthony Caro is conceptually really important for me because, well, he started to question the pedestal. His work was on the pedestal. And then, you know, he made something that is like his sculpture is halfway on the pedestal and halfway on the floor. And then eventually he got rid of the pedestal and became freestanding piece on the ground floor. And uh, I think that was a really important moment of our history to question the plinth. And then that is actually, that fed my interest of the, the public monument as well. 
you know. So, and Carl Andre, again, the famous piece is uh, the floor piece and, and then you can actually walk on it. And of course, you, re- you responded very directly with your work floor, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. So there's an interesting relationship with my American minimalism in a way. But my work is not really minimalism. I don't necessarily aesthetically like, you know, the works in the 70s in America. But the, 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 this group of artists, you know, including Frank Stella, for example, the shaped canvas, they really questioned ontological conditions of art, both in painting and the sculpture. And that is, I think that's the moment where I think the paradigm has shifted. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Cork Street Galleries. Cork Street in London has been the home of modern and contemporary art since the early 20th century and is where the UK careers of some of the greatest artists of recent times, artists like Francis Bacon, Max Ernst and Paul Clay, were launched. In 2019, the Pollen Estate doubled the amount of gallery space on the street as part of its commitment to the Cork Street Galleries initiative, reigniting Cork Street's reputation for innovation and cementing its status as an internationally significant destination for art in the 21st century. Cork Street Galleries accepts proposals for permanent occupations as well as temporary residences. For more information, go to corkstreetgalleries.com. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? Well, since I moved to London, it's it's been Tate Modern, simply because not only they have interesting exhibitions, but it's just across the river from my girls' uh, school. So we go visit there quite often. I don't try to to see the whole museum. You just go to see one thing or just running around in the turbine hole. Generally speaking, I'm more interested in like encyclopedic museums, for example, V&A. And before I came here, when I was living in New York, Metropolitan Museum and the MoMA was my favorite museums. Uh, I never questioned the museum when I was in Korea. So the way things were displayed or organized in the Korean museum seemed very rational and logical. I mean, basically, I learned Western art history from the book, basically, and I haven't really seen any of the canonical works in the Western art history until I first visited U.S. in my you know, mid-20s. Because it was not, there's a lot of restrictions to travel outside of Korea until early 80s. Right. I went to US for two months and the excuse was learning English there, but it took about two weeks to see entire collection of Metropolitan Museum of Art. Towards to the end, this revolution came to me and I was um, sitting on the long steps in front of the mat and having $1.50 hot dog from the, in, the stall in front of the mat. And then I was studying a uh, museum plan, you know, because it's a massive museum and I need a strategy to cover all the uh, collections. At that time, I wasn't sure when I was going to come back to US and I really wanted to see everything. I was doing it for already 10 days or something like that. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, this museum is like the cathedral. It's like a Christian church. I could see the cross on the, uh, the plan of the building. And it made sense why they placed medieval art in the middle of the cross. And actually it's in the basement, if you have been to and remember. Hmm. And then they actually built the floors on the top of that and their Renaissance or the most important sort of European art was actually was stacked on the top of each other. And then the artworks from the other civilization, for example, uh, Egyptian and African and Chinese, they're all in the annexes. It's all around the center. So like, so I learned there's a, this grand narrative. And then I started to see the walls between the galleries and these galleries, sort of a geography of the world divided by these artificial walls. Like there's a Middle East art and there's a Far East art. Even in Korean, the museum, we use the same term. 
So like we call it like far east and, you know, far east from whom, <laughs> right? So we were using these terms uh, without really thinking about it. And then I think that was the realization that there's a, some agenda going on, the way that things are organized in the museums. It didn't really took me further until I came back to U.S. to go to the art school until I took the art history class by uh, Marian Stanichevsky. So that was a really eye-opening experience. So I became aware of this sort of a post-colonial angle to everything. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Going to U.S. was probably a very important experience in my life. But then Again, it, it was not a culture shock, I have to say. And often my work has been seen as dealing with a culture shock, but I don't think I had a real culture shock. You know, when I was growing up in Korea, I mean, in a way, I learned my English from the radio station for American soldiers. You know, there's an American military presence in, in Korea, and there's a, the radio and TV stations called AFKN. I think it's American Forces Korean Network. And they play, you know, American pop songs. And also uh, on TV, I could watch all the Disney cartoons and things like that. So I became very familiar with uh, American pop culture bef even before I went to America. So it was exactly the same. What actually was uncomfortable was the orientation of the objects in the building. So it's a, spatially, it was a difference. So it was more like my body responding differently. You know, it's not a traumatic experience, but awkward enough to start to be aware of my surroundings. So I think a lot of my earlier work started from there. Now, which writers or poets do you return to? In terms of the novel or, or poetry, I'm still more comfortable with the Korean language. So um, I have a few Korean writers. I go back and Han Gang, I think her book Vegetarian is probably very well known in the West as well. But, and then also Kim Hoon, he's another writer, Korean writer. And I tend to go back to them. But then I think I'm more interested in uh, all kinds of writings than just sort of a literature, uh, pure literature, like a novel or poetry. Because um, my interest is actually all over the places. And my reading list is more like uh, anthropology, ecology, biology. I still really like to read about the fish, not just about the aspects of science, but also in terms of the, um, the civilization and culture that has been influenced by certain type of fish and trade. I mean, it's probably related to the uh, biology, but taxonomy related uh, books and the futurology you know, and also I've been reading a lot of history books, like a, but specifically for Korean history around 19th and 20th century, but written by non-Koreans, uh -huh. the, the people who visited Korea around that time. Because that time when the Korea was on the verge of, you know, colonization, a lot of countries are actually trying to take a career over and actually it started when I first moved to UK. I mean, you know, you learn this, the old history when you're in the school, but never in depth. So I just wanted to learn a little bit more what UK played in terms of to the Korean history. So I started to dig in and, and it was very interesting to see the Korean history through the eyes of foreigners. What about music? What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? 
I don't listen to music when I'm making art or in the process of you know something creative.、Uh, I found like music could be quite destructive. So there's no music、uh, in my studio. I only listen music when I'm taking a break, or lunch time, or something like that, or when I have to do something very mindless, repetitive tasks. And then I would listen to music, and I listen all kinds of musics. I just found myself actually going back to the、uh, classical rock, like rocks from sixties and seventies, like Yardbirds, Cream, you know, crazy American bands like Uriah Heeps, and you know, it's just all over the place. Like Prince, my daughters introduced Billie Eilish, oh yeah, and Grace Vanderwall, and then I also tend to. Go deeper into the individual musicians like Mark Knopfler, and the great thing about YouTube is you can find so many、uh, amazing live footages. Yeah. What about other media? Which other media influence your work? Probably architecture and film, but film as a documenting the space. So it's kind of somewhere between architectural photography, very specific. Genre of the photography, but what I'm trying to do is actually bring that architecture photography language into the moving image. So I guess that architecture and film. I mean, you you connected those two things very very clearly in that piece that you did、uh, working with the V&A on Robin Hood Gardens, didn't you? Which is this very important oh yeah building built by the Smithsons in. The 1960s, it was the 1970s, I think it opened. But anyway, in East London, Robin Hood Gardens, and and it's a it's a brutalist building, and it's been the source of enormous controversy because it's it's been demolished effectively,、um, and it's by、mm-hmm. very distinguished architects. But you made a film directly about that, didn't you? Yes. Originally, the museum wanted me to make some installation piece. I mean, for various reasons, I end up actually making a film. And and it was probably the first time that I worked on someone else's homes, and I had a very limited time.、Uh, it was quite urgent because you know the building was when we were filming the half of the building was being demolished. But prior to that project, I was actually experimenting different ways to document the architectural spaces, like as a like very small projects here and there. And for the Robin Hood Garden project, I just brought all these sort of techniques or vocabularies that I have、um, developed into that project. So I I started to、uh, make more works like that in a different buildings and landscapes. But I also working with the filmmaker, and we've been developing a different mechanism. Or devices to control the movement of the camera and things like that. So I just want to capture the the space in a different way. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it's going anywhere, but actually coming up with solution to to film a very difficult space to film. It's challenging, but I I really enjoy to try to solve those issues. So that's that's what I'm doing it, and then I think. After that, the way I actually see any other films is different now, because I see、uh, the films maybe director of the photography's point of view more. Is there a particular discipline in your daily working life that you see as an essential ritual? I don't have a discipline. <laughs>、uh, <laughs> you know,、uh, basically, my two young daughters、uh, dictate <laughs> my life, and I try to make a habit of taking my girls to school every morning. It's about our walk. Uh, for both ways, and then I come back to studio. Sometimes it's became harder and harder to have a very focused time. I don't know. Maybe it has got to do with aging, <laughs> or 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 like maybe 
there are just too many distractions. So this is not a ritual or discipline, but at least I found from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock uh, is when I feel quite alert and sharp. So I try to protect that time just for myself. This is something new in terms of my studio practice because of the lockdown. You know, I occupy my office space alone, which I love, <laughs> and my team work, you know, remotely. So since the lockdown, we've been having a regular team meeting and uh, surprisingly, it has been very productive. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm not a type of artist like who work from nine to five. I mean, if I were to do that, I could have been very productive, but for whatever reason, I'm not. And it, it is harder and harder for me to come up with, uh, with the great ideas. So that sort of four hour blog, I try to conceptualize the idea or honing my ideas. And then I share that ideas with my team and my, you know, my team at the beginning, it was difficult for everybody, but, uh, they start to give a very interesting feedbacks. And I noticed myself that actually I can come up with uh, new ideas as I was talking to these people. It's really been very successful, collaborative working, you know, relationship. If you could live with one work of art, what would it be? If it is my own work, that would be Artland, which is the uh, collaboration between me and my daughters. And uh, so that's going to be one. And if it is not my work, it could be that folk painting depicting Scholar's Library by this anonymous Korean painter. And lastly, what's art for? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, art is a lens to help us to be able to see ruptures in truth, we believe. Wow. Doho, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Doho Sa is in portable sculpture at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds, UK, opening in the spring of 2021. And when home won't let you stay, migrations in contemporary art at the Cantor Art Museum at Stanford University, which opens on the 21st of April and continues until the 30th of May. Doho Sa, 348 West 22nd Street, is on view at Los Angeles County Museum of Art until the 16th of May. And Doho's work is included in Victoria Miro's online exhibition, The Sky Was Blue, The Sea Was Blue, and the boy was blue until the 30th of April. And that's it for this episode and indeed this series. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening so that you can instantly get future episodes and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our other podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every Friday. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producers of the art newspaper podcasts are Judy Michalska and Amy Dawson. Thanks to Henrietta Bentel, Danielle Hathaway and Gabir Jalla. Huge thanks to Doho Sa and Amy Corrie. Join us on Friday for The Week in Art and we'll be back soon with more episodes of A Brush With. Bye for now. This episode of A Brush With is sponsored by Cork Street Galleries. To find out more about the original home of the art world, go to corkstreetgalleries.com. <laughs>